That is all in for this evening. The Rachel Maddow Show starts right now. Good evening, Rachel. Good evening, Chris. Thanks, man. And thanks to at home for joining us this hour. Uh, the invasion of Iraq started on March 20th, 2003. March 20th. On March 23rd, 2003, so still during the very first few days of the initial invasion period, on March 23rd, a long column of vehicles from the 3rd Infantry Division was driving from southern Iraq toward Baghdad when a maintenance company that was part of that big drive to Baghdad got hit by an ambush. And with the nation riveted to the start of that war, to what was supposed to be the shock and awe application of overwhelming force to start what would be definitely a short and triumphant war in Iraq, that ambush on the third day of the war gave the United States of America our first made-for-TV Iraq war household name. The name was Jessica Lynch. She was a diminutive 19-year-old blonde white female West Virginia soldier. But apparently beneath it all, she was a Rambo. On April 3rd, 2003, the Washington Post ran this front page story and photo of Jessica Lynch and told the story of her unbelievable heroism after the ambush on that day three of the Iraq war. Private Jessica Lynch, rescued Tuesday from an Iraqi hospital, fought fiercely and shot several enemy soldiers after Iraqi forces ambushed the Army's 507th Ordnance Maintenance Company, firing her weapon until she ran out of ammunition, U.S. officials said yesterday. Lynch, a 19-year-old supply clerk, continued firing at the Iraqis even after she sustained multiple gunshot wounds. She was fighting to the death, the official said. She did not want to be taken alive. Lynch was also stabbed when Iraqi forces closed in on her position, said the Washington Post. Sources also told the paper that after her rescue and her medevac, she was being treated for gunshot wounds and stab wounds. The Pentagon even managed to obtain night vision video footage of American special forces rushing into an Iraqi hospital to rescue her. The coverage of that rescue was unbelievably intense. One of the most dramatic moments of this war occurred early Wednesday morning, Iraqi time, in the dark in Nazaria. The rescue of Private First Class Jessica Lynch of West Virginia. NBC's Kerry Sanders was with the 8th Marines when the first tip came in. The rescue operation began with a fierce barrage from the 2nd Battalion 1st Marines, firing on Ba'ath Party headquarters to draw out Iraqi soldiers. That diversion providing cover so special operations forces could drop into Saddam Hospital. Just hours before, a handwritten note had been smuggled out of the hospital and handed to a Marine with the words, she's alive. The note gave the hospital room number where Jessica Lynch was being held. Within hours, Army Rangers, Navy SEALs, and Air Force pilots were executing a rescue operation. Inside, the U.S. forces found the Army Private First Class wounded, a gunshot to her leg. Military sources tell NBC News Jessica Lynch had been for several days at another hospital. In this room, her bloody uniform was found. It was torn, her name tag ripped off. Tonight, Jessica Lynch is in Germany, where she will receive medical treatment before heading home. Kerry Sanders, NBC News, Nazaria. Later in this broadcast, we'll take you to PFC Lynch's hometown in West Virginia, where the celebrations still are going on. Now to the heroic story of private first class Jessica Lynch, the POW rescued earlier this week. According to a report in the Washington Post, Jessica fought fiercely before she was captured. Even after she was shot in an ambush and some of her comrades died around her, she kept firing until she ran out of ammunition. One official describes her as fighting to the death. NBC's Dawn Fertangelo is at the Landstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany where Private Lynch is being treated. Dawn, good morning to you. Matt, good morning. Private Lynch is certainly the most celebrated patient here at Landstuhl Medical Center. Lynch and 14 other members of the 507th Ordnance Maintenance Company disappeared after being ambushed near An Nazaria. Military officials say she fought even well hurt until she ran out of ammunition. It was the first rescue of an American prisoner of war since World War II. 
and she was a hero. I mean, there, there was even talk of giving Jessica Lynch the Medal of Honor. Members of Congress from her home state of West Virginia put her up for the Medal of Honor, for the military's highest honor because of her heroism as a POW. She was a megawatt hero. She was brought home safe. Her rescue was all captured on film. It just could not have been scripted better by Hollywood for what they wanted day three of the Iraq war to end up like. But it turns out it may not have been scripted by Hollywood, but it was, in fact, scripted. The ambush did happen. Private First Class Jessica Lynch was injured. She did spend nine days in an Iraqi hospital, and she was rescued by American Special Forces. But the backstory of her heroics, emptying her weapon, fighting to the death, fighting through gunshot wounds and stab all of that was made up, as she herself said insistently from the very beginning. When I remember those difficult days, I remember the fear. I remember the strength. I remember that hand of that fellow American soldier reassuring me that I was going to be okay. At the same time, tales of great heroism were being told. At my parents' home in Work County, West Virginia, it was understaged by media, all repeating the story of the little girl Rambo from the hills of West Virginia who went down fighting. It was not true. I have repeatedly said when asked that if the stories about me helped inspire our troops and rally a nation, then perhaps there was some good. However, I'm still confused as to why they chose to lie and try to make me a legend. Did you fire your weapon back and did you kill any Iraqis? No. No. My weapon did jam and I did not shoot. Not a not a round, nothing. Well, you could have just let it go and said nothing. I could have, but I'm not about to take credit for someone or something that I didn't do. Jessica Lynch was the first American prisoner of war rescued since World War II. She was grievously injured in that ambush. Eleven members of her company died in that ambush and in the vehicle crashes that it caused, including Jessica Lynch's best friend, who died next to her in that Iraqi hospital in the next bed over. But Jessica Lynch did not go down shooting. There was not a bloody firefight and stabbing. She was not fighting to the death, like that headline said in the Washington Post. Incidentally, that article has been disappeared from the online archives of the Washington Post now. You can't find it anywhere. It turns out that the group of vehicles that Jessica Lynch and her company were in they were supposed to take a detour around the city of Nasiriya, but they didn't. They took a wrong turn, or more likely, it seems like they took a few wrong turns. And they ended up right in the city center. They were supposed to go around the city and not go through it at all. They ended up wrong turn after wrong turn right in the city center, undefended in territory where the U.S. Army knew there were likely to be attacks or ambushes, and they just drove right into it. It was day three of the war. Should that rescue not have happened? Should Jessica Lynch have been left there? Seriously, is that what we think about these things now? Private First Class Jessica Lynch, star of the show of that rescue, if the heroics that the Pentagon made up about her didn't really happen, and they didn't, maybe the U.S. Special Forces who rescued her and the other Americans held in that hospital, maybe they shouldn't have bothered. After all, maybe it was sort of their own screw-up that got them ambushed and hurt and captured in the first place. Is that how we think about these things now? Is that how we think now about that rescue in hindsight, knowing what we know now? Because that kind of a case, that obscenity of a case that maybe some Americans might deserve to be left behind, that is the new cause celeb on the American right right now. That the American prisoner of war, the last and only one still held from either the Iraq war or the Afghanistan war, the American prisoner of war, Bo Bergdahl, he did not deserve to be freed. That the U.S. government working to free him, succeeding in freeing him, that was a shame somehow because, yeah, sure, he was an American soldier, but he was a bad one. Questions this morning of whether Sergeant Bergdahl was a deserter or potentially a collaborator with the Taliban even. Pentagon sources confirming to Fox that many in the intelligence community had had serious concerns that he not only had deserted his post, but that he may have indeed been working in some way with the enemy. It's pretty clear that he, he's a 
looks to me like a deserter or a traitor or, or both, and why the Obama administration would give away five terrorists to get him back is kind of be beyond me. Again, five Americans were killed looking for him, at least. And, and uh, I think if anybody uh, needs a phone call or some reassurance or some condolence, it's those five families saying, listen, we're really sorry we sent your uh, sons out to get killed uh, looking for this, uh, uh, this traitor. And that the one we traded five hardened terrorists for himself deserted, uh, got six Americans killed. Wh why are we doing anything to get this guy back? He, he's, he's ashamed to be an American. Um, he calls America disgusting. He wanted to leave, so he left. Well, he got what he wanted. That is the timber on the American right today. As the country celebrated the return of America's only prisoner of war from the war in Afghanistan, the right decided to condemn the president for getting the soldier freed, and then to condemn the soldier himself. And now, in a special show of class with a K, they have moved on to attacking the soldier's family. It is Robert Bergdahl, the father, who is also engendering some controversy. He has learned to speak Pashto, the language of the Taliban, and looks like a Muslim. He's also somewhat sympathetic to Islam, actually thanking Allah right in front of the president. Those with uh, sources tell Fox News that in the executive branch that they're quite baffled by the White House decision to allow the president to stand alongside Sergeant Berg's, uh, Bergdahl's father. He says he was growing his beard because his son was uh, because his son was in captivity. Well, your son's out now. Right. So if you really don't lo no longer want to look like a member of the Taliban, you don't have to look like a member of the Taliban. Are you out of razors? On the American right, in Republican politics and in conservative media, there apparently is nothing to celebrate in an American prisoner of war coming home after five years. Because look at his dad. He looks like a, looks like a Muslim. The administration's response and the U.S. military's response to all of this has so far been uh, fairly calm, but also pretty forceful. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff last night issued a statement saying, quote, the questions about this particular soldier's conduct are separate from any effort, from our effort, excuse me, to recover any U.S. service member in enemy captivity. And he wrote the word any in all caps. President Obama also spoke to the issue today as well uh, on the first leg of his European trip in Poland. The United States has always had uh, a pretty sacred rule, and that is uh, we don't leave uh, our men or women in uniform behind. And. Uh, that dates back to the earliest days of our revolution. With respect to the circumstances of uh, Sergeant Bergdahl's uh, capture by the Taliban, uh, we obviously have not been interrogating Sergeant Bergdahl. He is recovering from five years of captivity uh, with the Taliban. But let me just make a, a, a very simple point here, and that is, regardless of the circumstances, whatever those circumstances may uh, turn out to be, we still get an American soldier back if he's held in captivity, period, full stop. We don't condition that. Uh, and that's what every mom and dad who sees a, uh, a son or daughter sent over into war theaters should expect from uh, not just their commander in chief, but the United States of America. Should we try to get soldiers home when they are held prisoner? Or should we subject those prisoners and their worthiness for rescue to some sort of test about how they got captured and whether they were negligent or they left their post or they were incompetent somehow, or maybe they made a dumb wrong turn or maybe they went down fighting, but maybe their dad has too long a beard. Do we leave no soldier behind in captivity? Is that an American value and an American military principle? Or do we leave some of them behind? Because some of them, frankly, aren't worth it, according to the Fox News Channel. 
Yesterday and today, a political strategist who worked for the George W. Bush administration as a staffer uh, and who for a time was Mitt Romney's foreign policy spokesman during his presidential campaign, uh, that political operative has been organizing media strategy for a couple of days now to try to stoke criticism of this soldier who has just spent five years in enemy hands and is now on his way home. It's an organized effort now to try to organize opposition and condemnation of this man who's getting out after five years of captivity. Bef before this happened, you could not invent a hypothetical scenario in which this is the way it would play out. Before this happened, you would have laughed out of the room a would-be screenwriter who tried to sell you a plot about the freeing of an American prisoner of war being treated as bad news in the United States of America. But incredibly, that really is where we are now.